know about the home base program, it's the first of its kind in the nation. And the official title is the Red Sox Foundation Massachusetts General Home Base Program. And what they provide is clinical care and support services to Iraq and Afghanistan service members, veterans, and their families throughout New England who are affected by deployment or combat related stress or traumatic brain injury. They offer clinical and community education about the invisible wounds of war and the challenges of military families. They conduct research to improve the treatment and understanding of post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. And they strive to be a model partnership of academic medicine and major league baseball in service to our military veterans and our families. This is Tommy Furlong from Home Base. He's gonna be presenting today. And I believe um, Jacqueline Francona is gonna be joining him later yes. as well. Thanks, All right. Tommy. Thanks. Well, thanks, Beth. Uh, um, we all, I, I love coming here to, to BCC. It's always uh, a really friendly and, and easy experience for me. Um, so I have been with the home base program for about two years now. I'm part of the veteran outreach team there. Uh, it consists of six veterans. Uh, we're all combat veterans. Uh, and really our job is to not only educate out in the community, uh, but also to uh, add as like peer support uh, to veterans who do come into the program and then help out with any non-clinical needs they have, employment, housing, GI Bill benefits, comp and pen, uh, benefits, things like that. Um, the original uh, name of this presentation was a little different, um, but what has happened in March is uh, the Student Veterans of America uh, recently did a very big research project. It was called the Million, uh, Million Records uh, Project. And it basically uh, combined about one million uh, service members um, and just got some great demographics and statistics about how they compare to other students, uh, gender, race, um, the types of degrees they're going for, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of great information and it's very recent. It just came out in March 2014. Uh, so there's some great, great information in there about that. I'm just going to be doing a little jogging act back and forth here. Um, but uh, what I'm going to be covering today uh, is the demographics, like I was saying, we'll be talking about that, uh, the invisible wounds of war, uh, talking a bit about student veterans, and just a quick overview of home-based programs since I'm here, I guess I have to plug it. Um, so just to do a little bit of background, um, obviously the war started uh, September 11, 2001, and at, at the home-based program we treat veterans of the post-9-11 conflict. Uh, so right now that is uh, Iraq, uh, Operation New Dawn, uh, and Afghanistan. So just some background, uh, less than 1% of Americans serve in the military. Uh, about 2.5 million service members have deployed uh, in these recent conflicts, and over 800,000 of them uh, have deployed multiple times, um, and many more than five times my brother's uh, in the Navy, uh, I was in the Marines, um, but he just got back from his fourth deployment. Uh, so it is something that is uh, very common uh, to deploy more than once. Uh, and we have a much more heavy reliance on the National Guard, uh, reserve units, things like that. And as you can see, more than two million children have experienced a parental deployment uh, with over 700,000 uh, happening more than once. So the veteran population, uh, about 47% of active duty service members have children. Uh, so you can see how that could impact student veterans uh, when they transition out and into the uh, institutes of higher education. And 14% and of those uh, are single parents. Uh, so about one third of all military personnel live on base and within the National Guard uh, represents approximately 45% of the total military force. So it is a very large component of it. Uh, here in Massachusetts, there's an estimated 45,000 uh, Massachusetts men and women that have served since 9-11 uh, and about 385,000 veterans live in Massachusetts and obviously those numbers just keep growing. Okay, so understanding military culture. Um, when working with, with veterans, civilians you know, should be uh, military and culturally competent, uh, be able to understand reasons why people serve. Um, I, I always hate to pigeonhole veterans um, and say that if they're a one-size-fits-all community, but uh, people automatically assume that people join the military because they love this country and they want to fight for it. Um, that is the case for a lot of us, uh, but for some it's for 
educational benefits, uh, or other reasons just to get out of a bad situation, uh, things like that. Um, it's important to know command structures, uh, language is important, uh, and as well as attention to detail. Uh, so even with our program, when we first came out with our, our little symbol, um, we had a lot of people coming up to us saying, hey, what's up with the camo pattern? Uh, it looks like the old Desert Storm camis, uh, but you can't please everybody and every branch has its own, uh, you know, uh, MARPAD patterns right now, uh, so we had to stick with this one. Um, so just naming the conflicts of here, GWAT, uh, it's the Global War, War on Terror, uh, OEF, uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, OIF, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and OND, Operation New Dawn, uh, which was in the end of combat operations in Iraq. Uh, so the military branches, uh, we, we cover all of those. Uh, anybody who is technically a veteran by uh, definitions of Massachusetts, we will see. Um, so it's just really how to refer to someone who's served. Um, but we, what we do find is that uh, if a veteran, if a military service member does not deploy, they may not consider themselves a veteran and they may not know what that constitutes. Um, so we like to use the term service member. Have you served? Or, uh, are you a service member? Uh, and a lot of times we'll get the answer yes more than no. So starting conversations, this is something that uh, when I go out and speak to colleges, they ask me a lot. Uh, how do I engage veterans? Um, what should, what can I say, what can I not say? Um, and there's really no right or wrong answer. Um, veterans are not, like I said, we're not a one-size-fits-all community. It's, it's individually dependent. I know people who like when people say thank you for their service, and I know uh, service members who hate it uh, and will actually question, why, why do you think I serve? Um, so it really just depends. It depends on the relationship you have with your student veterans. Um, but you can ask, hey, what, what branch, how long did you serve, where did you deploy? Um, you know, how, how are things going right now? Uh, how's the family? Like I said, 47% uh, of service members do have some sort of family and some sort of dependence. Yes? Absolutely. As to what your understanding is as to the reasons why some people would not appreciate that question or, or appreciate that comment, thank you for your service. Uh, of the reasons people give for not. I, I think it's... Uh, for a lot of veterans, they feel like it's just lip service at this point, um, where it's just kind of like, oh, you serve, all right, great, thank you for your service. Um, understanding why they say it, why, why you're asking me that question, or why, uh, um, what are you thanking me for? What did I do personally for you? Like, I did this for myself, it has nothing to do with the, there are, there are individuals who feel that way, so. Sure. So just some combat uh, experiences of the, the U.S. infantry. This was taken um, early in the Iraq War, but as you can see, there's some significant numbers there. About 93% have received some sort of incoming artillery, rocket, mortar, uh, small arms fire. Uh, you see 91% had been actually attacked, ambushed, uh, know someone seriously injured or killed, about 87%. Um, so there's some significant numbers uh, right there. Uh, and as far as reintegration goes, um, it's often the toughest time. Leaving the military, ending uh, one part of your life and moving on to the next uh, is not the easiest thing to do. Um, and a lot of times the physical safety of being home, being out of theater, allows for the processing of experiences um, that they may not have been able to do while they're in theater. Um, so uh, for instance, I was a platoon commander uh, in the Marine Corps. Um, and uh, ended up losing two of my Marines in my platoon. Uh, it, but it was uh, one of those things we look back on now, and it, it hurts every time. Um, but while you're there, it's just something that you need to, can, the mission is not gonna stop. Uh, you, you grieve for that day, and then the next day it's back, it's back, to, uh, it's back to the grind, it's back to patrolling, uh, it's back to the everyday mission. Um, so when you, when you then transition out, uh, you have, uh, you have that decompression time, you have the time to, uh, to think about those experiences. And that's why a lot of service members start to feel some guilt about some of their, their actions during deployment. Uh, they start to question uh, some of the things that they did um, and some of the mistakes that they may have made that led to, uh, led to their friends dying. Um, so it's hard to turn off that, kill, uh, that, that, that uh, skill set. Is, uh, I'm sorry, kill set, yeah. It's hard to turn off that skill set. Uh, as, a, um, as an infantryman, my job was to any sort of 
uh, aggression shown towards me. Obviously, my job is to come back tenfold. Um, and it was, it was just instinct. They drill it into your head. That's what you do. That's how you, that's how you fight wars. Um, but when you transition out, it's not the easiest thing to do uh, when returning to the civilian world. So any sort of uh, aggression showed towards me, I would be aggressive on the back end. Uh, it took a little while when I got out to, go, to, to realize that oh, this is probably not the, the way I want to respond uh, to a lot of people. Um, and uh, it's, it's not easy to turn off that skill set. Uh, so we like to say, we like to help veterans achieve like a dimmer switch. So you know how to turn it down, uh, you know how to control it, uh, and really just move on. Tommy, could you just elaborate yes. on what in theater means for those people who might not know? Oh, yes. So in theater uh, means uh, when you're in a uh, theater of operations, so Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Africa right now, um, lot, you know, uh, if you've been deployed to, to an actual, uh, yes, sure. So some co common problems with reintegration that we see uh, is sleeping, uh, whether getting initially to sleep or staying asleep. Uh, Hypervigilance, feeling that heightened state of situational awareness, being anxious in certain situations like crowds, uh, the supermarket, things like that. Um, less tolerance, as I was just talking about, that anger, irritability, uh, relationship issues. Um, this may be due to uh, secretiveness um, or if the, the veteran is dealing with some sort of uh, depression or some sort of guilt from deployment related uh, stressors then uh, why would they in turn want to tell their spouse about that, uh, which can cause uh, some relationship issues there. Um, and then avoidance and withdrawal, managing that hypervigilance. So I'm just going to talk quickly about the invisible wounds of war. Uh, so as you can see, one in three veterans returning from either Iraq or Afghanistan has experienced some sort of stressor, whether that's combat stress, uh, depression, or traumatic brain injury. Uh, and with PTSD in the spotlight, people know about it now, uh, the stigma is lowering, um, but what we don't know a lot about is traumatic brain injury. We know that it exists, we know that the IED is the weapon of choice, um, and we know that they are everywhere uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and the IEDs produced a sort of blast field, uh, pressure, uh, pressure events, and can cause polytrauma. So what is PTSD? Um, well, it begins with a normal response to extraordinary situations or events. Uh, it's behavior that is adaptive in theaters, uh, can cause hypervigilance, increased arousal, uh, can lead to difficulty with reintegration. Uh, and when recovery doesn't happen on its own, PTSD can develop. Uh, there's a graph that I'm going to kind of show here in a second that's going to explain that. And, uh, and I'll walk everybody through it. Uh, but previous trauma uh, is a significant risk factor for future PTS. Um, so a lot of veterans that do have the signs and symptoms of PTS uh, and actually have been diagnosed have had uh, trauma before they've even joined the military. So a lot of that is actually compounded uh, when they deploy. So this is the natural versus the impeded recovery. Uh, so what you see on the top is someone who does not uh, end up coming down from that PTS. So, so the, the, this is the normal pattern. If someone experiences a traumatic event, uh, say you get into a car accident, um, well, the next time you step into your car, you're probably going to be more cautious. Um, you're going to look both ways. Uh, you're you're going to make sure everything's safe before you, you head out when the light turns green. Uh, whatever happened, uh, you're just going to be a little bit more, uh, little bit more conscious. Uh, I like to explain this graph when talking about uh, the Boston bombings, because it's the most recent event, uh, and it's kind of the easiest to relate, especially with the IEDs. Um, but uh, after the bombing happened, the next day everybody kind of felt a little anxious, right? Like you have the, those little feelings of anxiousness. Well, with an average infantry unit, uh, my unit saw about 19 IEDs a week. Uh, that was about the average. Uh, so you take the Boston bombings, you add one more IED onto that, and now you make it every day for nine months straight. Um, it starts to become a normal everyday thing. Uh, so when it doesn't happen, um, you start to expect it. Um, so as you can see in the top, uh, it, they just kind of get stuck. You get st stuck in this, in this mentality uh, that something bad uh, may happen or, or you start to get those feelings associated with it.
So diagnosis is complicated, and since we treat both PTS and TBI uh, at the home base program, uh, oftentimes symptoms are very similar. Um, and what we're finding now is uh, obviously with the amount of IEDs, we didn't know a lot about them before, uh, especially early in the conflicts. Um, so chances are if you hit an IED or one went off next to you, uh, or multiple went off, okay, I got all my limbs, I'm good to go, uh, let's keep patrolling. Um, well, at, over time, those concussive blasts uh, will take a toll. They do take a toll on you. Uh, you're wearing the Kevlar, that actually creates more of a resonation uh, for when a blast field is produced. Uh, so over time, uh, you may develop a mild traumatic brain injury uh, and you may not know about it because you've never been checked out. Um, and that was true for me during my first deployment where there we were clearing a city, there were no bases, so every day was just house to house fighting. Um, an IED goes off, okay, I'm fine, let's keep going. Um, so over time that does, that, that can cause issues. Um, and what we're seeing right now too is if you've never been asked, if you've never been asked if you've been involved in an IED uh, or involved in a blast, uh, you may not know you have a traumatic brain injury. Uh, so we're finding that people are being diagnosed, going to private providers, maybe not the VA, uh, not being asked if they're a veteran or been involved in a blast, and now they're being diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, uh, and they've never actually been asked, hey, you're involved, you've been involved in a blast? Okay, well this may be a traumatic brain injury. Have you been checked out for that? Uh, a lot of times the answer is no. And just with new research happening now, uh, we're learning a lot more about traumatic brain injury and how it affects individuals. So as you can see, the top of the two, uh, uh, top two columns are the uh, symptoms that are similar. Uh, so the insomnia, memory problems, poor concentration, uh, depression, anxiety, irritability, uh, and below are the uh, two columns where they may be different. So this is uh, just a picture of my EOD team uh, in Afghanistan. This was a controlled detonation. Um, so this is uh, an ID that we found and we detonated ourselves um, so we could keep moving. Um, but one of the questions we ask on our intakes uh, is, have you, been have you been within 100 meters of a blast? Uh, so that's all it takes. If you've been within 100 meters of a large blast, uh, you may have some effects. Well, we look to be within 100 meters right there, and this is an IED that we detonated ourselves. Uh, so as you can see, um, a lot of us have been within that 100 meters of a blast, even if it wasn't enemy created, uh, and this was an everyday thing. Uh, and IEDs are, as I was saying before, they are the weapon of choice. Um, the two individuals in this picture, uh, Gunny Pate here on the left, uh, was actually uh, killed during his next deployment by an IED. Uh, and Sar Morris on the right uh, is a double amputee now. Um, so just my EOD team, the two men right there, uh, both um, experienced very, very significant uh, blasts. So this is just another IED uh, that hit one of the convoys um, that I was on. And you can see the blast effects here uh, and how that could create a concussive effect within the vehicle. Um, so these vehicles are created where everybody actually in the vehicle is, was okay, uh, luckily enough, but you can see the blast, how it ripped through the engine, uh, but luckily the, the V-shaped hulls on these new vehicles called the MATVs, um, they, they're built very well uh, and can protect us uh, very well from IED blasts, uh, but it still creates that, that resonation on the concussive effects. Whoops. So what may happen during a blast is you get the initial blast uh, if you're facing it from the front, um, which can hit the frontal lobe. Um, you may fall, so your brain's kind of getting that shaking motion. It's hitting the front, then it's hitting the back, and then any secondary uh, shrapnel or uh, any other you know, uh, particles within that IED may hit you as well. Uh, and like I said, you're always wearing a Kevlar when you're outside the wire, uh, so those Kevlars can resonate as well. And, uh, and, and make, make the blast worse. So just some symptoms of TBI, uh, headaches, insomnia, uh, hearing issues. They may have uh, visual issues, blurred sight, blurred vision, uh, seeing spots. Uh, they may get dizzy, uh, um, have some fatigue. Uh, some of the cognitive 
uh, issues or difficulty concentrating. Again, I, what I was talking about, the misdiagnosis of ADHD or ADD, uh, forgetfulness, uh, problems making decisions, things like that. Uh, and then the emotional side, uh, easily frustrated, the depression, anxiety, and anger. So evidence-based treatments work. Uh, people are always uh, worried about uh, mental health treatment, and especially within the veteran community where we're already overprescribed. Um, meds just seem to be the easy answer to everything. Um, we're, we're cautious about the, the different, uh, different therapies used, and we don't want, uh, a lot of us don't want to use medication. Um, well, with prolonged exposure therapy, it's a, uh, what that is exactly is like, it's basically like a 12 to 16 week session uh, and a veteran will come in um, and they may talk about a significant event, they may write about a significant event, and really the point is to just keep talking about it, keep reliving it um, until it becomes boring to you. So if you see a horror movie for the first time when you're a kid and you're really scared, um, it's, it's really going to affect you. Well the next time you see it you may be a little less scared uh, and you watch it over and over again and it uh, just kind of becomes, you, you know what to expect. Uh, it doesn't affect you as much. Um, so that's really the point with the prolonged exposure therapy. And the evidence-based treatments do work. The sooner, the better. Um, but obviously with mental health treatment, uh, it's the, oftentimes the last priority uh, on everyone's list. So uh, physical injuries, it's okay. Uh, if everyone you know, knows to go right to the doctor, but with mental health care, uh, it's usually the last, uh, last priority on the, on the list. Um, there's cognitive processing therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. They're all a little bit different. Uh, I'm not going to go too, too much into it. For, uh, hey, dude. Yeah. Uh, and we have a couples therapy for PTS. It uh, treats both the relationship and the PTSD within the veteran. Uh, and obviously, we do have pharmacological treatments as well. Uh, but the couples-based treatment is great. Um, a lot of times, uh, veterans will get out. They know they may need some help. Uh, go see a therapist, but now the family isn't involved at all. Well, just the fact that you can take your husband, your wife, uh, your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, uh, to the therapy with you so they learn more, they're educated, uh, and treats the relationship as a whole as well uh, is, in, is very new for PTS and uh, was actually created by one of the clinicians at the home base program and now being utilized within the VAs. Uh, so it's a great new therapy. Virtual reality and exposure therapy is something starting to be used. And when you first look at it, it looks kind of a little hokey. It looks like a video game. But in reality, what this is is used in conjunction with the prolonged exposure therapy. Uh, so if there is a significant traumatic event, we can recreate that event. And it's not about the recreation. It's more about getting all of your senses involved. Um, so uh, there may be certain triggers that set somebody off, uh, and they may not know what that is. It may be. Uh, a sound, it may be smell, it may be a combination of the two. Well, with the virtual reality, you can recreate an event. Uh, you got the rubber ducky rifle, so you're, you're feeling, uh, you got the same uh, body language going on, the, the same mannerisms you had in the, uh, in the military. Uh, you got the scent palette, which will put out weapon fire, smells, cordite, uh, burning rubber, garbage, things like that. You got the earphones on, the radio chatter starts going, uh, and things start to become are real. So oftentimes we just want to tease out uh, certain memories and that, that alone might help us quite a bit with the therapy session. So there are also many comorbidities uh, that go along with the PTS, uh, substance abuse being a big one. Uh, at home base we have right now about 140 to 150 patients usually within that window. Um, and within two-thirds of those patients, there is some sort of substance abuse issue, whether that's alcohol to get them to sleep at night, they drink to get to sleep, uh, maybe smoke a little pot to get to sleep, um, or uh, they're using opiates. Uh, I have a good friend that was uh, shot in Iraq, uh, was, was uh, medevaced out, uh, given uh, you know, quite a few of the oxys, uh, actually recovered, went back to his unit, was shot again, uh, and uh, then finally sent home for good, um, but just from the pain ha had, a, uh, had quite a large prescription uh, for oxycodone, um, just became addicted uh, because of the pain was so bad. Uh, then he was living with his wife, obviously. Uh, she was having to deal with this every day, and then she became addicted to the oxys as well. Uh, so it can be a vicious cycle, um, and oxycodone and different opiates uh, are uh, 
our main concern. Um, as you can see, there's also pain and uh, suicidal, uh, suicidal thoughts. So the Guard right now is having uh, a really rough time, especially the Mass National Guard. I think they've had seven uh, suicides uh, in the past, I think this, this year alone. Um, so it is, uh, it is a significant issue. Um, but with the mental health issue, there, there's also physical injuries. Um, so as you can see, there's lots, lots of orthopedic issues, chronic pain, musculoskeletal issues, which is the biggest one. Uh, but you'll see hearing problems, uh, hearing loss, ringing in the ears, uh, respiratory illnesses from sand dust, or just uh, really the big one there is the burn pits. If you're in country, everything, uh, you, every piece of trash is gonna be burned. Oh, thanks, Jackie. Um, skin conditions, rashes, bacterial infections, and then obviously the major traumas, so gunshot wounds, shrapnel, traumatic brain injuries. <coughs> so this is the graph that represents all the physical, uh, physical wounds, but as you can see, the musculoskeletal uh, issues are the biggest one with 1.7 million. Uh, but this is a great graph, just kind of breaks it down uh, as, into, into what's what. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about student veterans, and I found this online, I thought it was really funny. Uh, so how it feels to use your GI Bill. Um, and uh, so with this kind of comes, uh, who, who is a student veteran? Uh, what is their demographic? What are, they, what are their needs? Um, and with that new, as I was telling you about that new million records uh, survey, I'm gonna use a lot of the information uh, in this next part. So just some definitions here before we start. The traditional student veteran is going to be someone under the age of 24, um, probably financially dependent uh, on their parents, and uh, may or may not uh, be an employee somewhere. Uh, the non-traditional student is someone above the age of 24, typically. Um, they are probably financially dependent, uh, and the military st students and student veterans almost mirror the non-traditional students, so the, a lot of times they are above the age of 24, uh, financially dependent and have dependents of their own, whether uh, you know, family, uh, spouse, or uh, children. So just a graph kind of showing the similarities between the two. Uh, as you can see on the right, the traditional student um, and the non-military, non-traditional in the military here, just the age bracket, uh, very similar. Um, and as you can see, not, uh, not the case for the traditional student veteran. Yeah, traditional students, sorry. So demographics of the student veterans by gender. Um, so as you can see, females represent 27% uh, of the student veteran community. Uh, this number is significant because females make up about 14% of the military community. Uh, so they are overrepresented uh, on college campuses. Um, so more female veterans are taking advantage of the GI Bill than their male counterparts. Oh, this is a demographic of marital status. So when I was talking about before that, 47% uh, is really a significant number. So about 33% are married uh, and are parents. Um, about 15% married with no dependents. And as you can see, that 14% single parent. Uh, and then the 3% dependent. So this kind of breaks it down by institution. Uh, so you got around 60% are going to either a two-year or a four-year four school, uh, with about 8% using those GI Bill uh, benefits for graduate school, and 28% uh, in the other category, which is your vocational schools, uh, trade schools, um, other things like that. This is broken down by by majors, um, their degree fields. Uh, so you can see liberal arts and sciences, the big one. Uh, followed by business, and then we have uh, homeland security, law enforcement, the firefighting, fire sciences, uh, things like that. Um, about 9% in the health professionals, and about 7% in the engineering technologies. So comparative demographics. Um, I, I love this, this graph because it, it kind of just breaks it down by everything. Uh, so as you can see, um, within the, the student veteran service member community, uh, there are a larger component of African Americans and Hispanic uh, students. So uh, just compared to the non-veteran civilian student, there's a larger community there. Uh, 
as well as a larger community for the first time students. So the first generational students, you can see the gap there, the 61% as compared to that 42%. And uh, just some, just some inter I found this slide really interesting. Uh, just the percentage of student ve veterans and service members uh, as far as um, how sort of like social life on campus, the activities they're being involved in. So uh, just comparatively right here, you can see that uh, providing care for dependents, living with them, you got 43% as opposed to the 12% uh, participating in co uh, curricular activities. There's a lower number there. Uh, for obvious reasons, how hey, you get done with class, chances are you have to go home and take care of your family. Um, working for pay on campus, chances are student veterans are probably going to go somewhere else. And uh, commuting to class, a uh, larger number there as well. So why is it important to identify student veterans? Well, the percentage of student veterans who have said they've had uh, attempted suicide was six times higher that than of the uh, general college student population. Uh, and I don't really want to give these numbers to alarm you. Um, this, the, the Rudd study has been uh, a significant study, though I do feel that the numbers are a bit high, just anecdotally. Um, but as you can see, 82% of those who attempted suicide also struggled with significant uh, PTS symptoms. So really the answer is, uh, is if someone is dealing with someone, uh, are, are, is dealing with some sort of combat stress, deployment-related stressor, transitional, uh, related stressor, uh, talking to them and getting them to seek help uh, sooner than later uh, is the best course of action. And it's always hard to bring up conversations like that, um, but just talking to someone uh, can really just make a difference. So we're going to skip this because we couldn't get it to work. Jack, it doesn't work. Yeah. 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 So just uh, that's uh, what we call Shane's story. Uh, Shane is. Uh, He's like 6'5", 240. Uh, he's a Dorchester native, uh, just a really tough guy. Uh, and uh, served in Afghanistan, and um, just really had a hard time coming home. And really his story is uh, about a panic attack he had in a Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, he was waiting in line for a, for a uh, coffee, and uh, just kind of broke down and started crying. Um, and he knew that he needed to do something, didn't know why he was feeling this way, uh, and ended up coming to home base, uh, doing a prolonged exposure therapy, and uh, just really turning his life around. Um, and he was at the point where he just did not want to live anymore. Um, and uh, we love to use that story because it's, uh, especially within the, the, the combat arms community, uh, just being, you know, being a tough guy, being, uh, just being able to deal with stuff, soldier on, uh, is, uh, you know, it's something we all do. And it's hard to admit that we have some sort of issue. Uh, so I love that, that, that video because, uh, um, He's a, you know, he's a rugged dude, uh, but even he was having problems as well. So if he was, I mean, anybody can have him. And I will send the video out to everybody. Yes. Yes, thanks, Beth. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure that you get a copy of this uh, presentation. Uh, as you can see, about 35% of, uh, of the sample experienced, uh, experienced some sort of severe anxiety. And this is, again, that red study. 24% uh, experienced severe depression. Uh, almost 46% experience significant symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and that could be anything from the sleeping uh, to the hypervigilance. Um, there were significant numbers of participants thinking about suicide, um, with about 20% having a plan, 10% thinking about it often, 7% uh, making an attempt, and actually 3.8% believing that suicide is either likely or, or very likely. So something you might see in the classroom, again, like I said at the beginning, I hate to broad brush veterans and, and pigeonhole them. Uh, but some things we, we've heard a lot that we typically see uh, are sitting around the edges of the room, needing to see the door, not wanting to sit in the middle of the class, liking, like to have that uh, perception, be able to see everybody, uh, constantly scanning the room, uh, frustration or impatience with developmentally younger peers. Uh, no, really? Yes. Um, one of the classes I took when I got out, uh, there was someone in my class who, like every 10 minutes, would ask, and this is probably not even because I'm a veteran, uh, but would ask, uh, is this going to be on the test? And like, I, I couldn't pay attention. The whole, I just knew it. I'd, like the whole class, I would just get upset and looking at my people like, everything's going to be on the test. <laughs> just listen. Uh, so uh, you, you also see withdrawal cl from classes uh, disappearing. They may come for like the first half. Uh, of the semester and then just disappear, kind of fall off the face of the earth. Um, but uh, 
you know, doing something about it, talking to them uh, is the best course of action there. Ask them what's going on, what are they dealing with. Uh, and if they are dealing with something, well, there's some great places they can go to get help. Yes? So if a student doesn't self-identify, though, and somehow maybe a faculty member knows if it's on there, I'm from Johnson Wales, by the way, so I need to crash this party. Cool. Um, but, I'm really interested in this. but so maybe they have a way of finding it on Banner or Kippersoft, mm -hmm. they have access to that information. Would it be okay for a faculty member to approach that student who hasn't self-identified to say, is there something you want to talk about? Oh, sure. Is, I mean, Okay. Absolutely. My, my, the rule of thumb I use is, is um, don't ask any questions you're not comfortable with the answer with. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're comfortable answering, answer, asking me the question, chances are I'm probably com I'm comfortable with the answer. So. And and you have this um, yes. Do you think it's, it's okay to reach out to them? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And it's okay to ask too. Are you a veteran? Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, oh yes. Yeah, sorry. Students with disabilities. Sure. Mm. Um, and is you know, enrolled in the Velox program. Oh, all right, great. These accommodations. So very often they do want to disclose. There might not be a time to do it. So the accommodation plan, if the student agrees, <coughs> the time. Right, right. And self-identifying is, you're, you're right, it is, it's not something that, that you know, a lot of veterans do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just, just asking is, yeah. I, I wouldn't highlight it during class, but, no, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, so understanding student veterans know who's in your class before starting politically charged conversations. Um, I'm okay. I like politically charged conversations. I'll, I'll talk your ear off all day. Uh, but a lot of people don't like them. So uh, be aware if you notice changes, like I was saying, in attendance, uh, drop in grades, participation. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, and again, no two student veterans are alike. Uh, avoid the stereotypes. Um, and I, I did it myself, you know, sitting around the room. Uh, it's very common, but it's not something I did. Um, so it, it doesn't work for everybody. It's, we're, we're not a one-size-fits-all community. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the home base program. Thanks for uh, sitting here for so long listening to me talk. Usually I like to break it up with the video. Um, but uh, OK, so what our mission is, we heal the invisible wounds of war uh, by connecting Iraq and Afghanistan veterans uh, and their families uh, to world-class care. So what world-class care is, that high-quality, evidence-based, patient-centered, uh, safe, technologically advanced, or culturally competent, uh, and we provide an efficient, uh, provide, this, provide those services in an efficient and timely manner. So just a little bit about us. Um, the program, the, the uh, development of the program kind of started in 2007 after the the Red Sox won the World Series. They went down to uh, visit the president, just like they did about a month ago. Um, and after that, they went over to Walter Reed uh, to do a tour of the facility, which, the, again, they did this time. Um, but what was supposed to be about a 45-minute tour ended up turning into a, like a four-hour tour. Um, and the owners of the Sox wanted to do something uh, at that point with veterans when they returned home. So this is kind of how the program got started. Um, and one of the physicians for the Red Sox was also a Mass General Hospital uh, clinician. So uh, that's really kind of how the, the wheels started to get turning. Um, but you have Massachusetts General Hospital. It's the number one hospital uh, in New England. It's ranked by News and World Report. You got the largest independent biomedical research enterprise in the country uh, and one of the largest and oldest teaching affiliate of the Harvard Medical School. So uh, the treatment that you're getting at home base uh, is some of the best treatment you can get uh, in the country. Now, there's no better place to be than, than New England, especially the Boston area, uh, for hospitals. Um, so we love you know, when veterans take advantage of the program. All right, so really our goals, uh, as Beth kind of talked about right in the, uh, in the introduction, is we connect to care, so we raise awareness, uh, reducing barriers, uh, building teams. Uh, we provide world-class care with improved models and innovative care. Uh, in the advanced care, we provide improved treatments, we train providers, and that shift paradigm, the public-private partnerships, um, which has been great for our program, uh, just with the partnership between Mass General Hospital and the Red Sox Foundation. 
So I'm part of the outreach team. Uh, so we're all combat veterans on the team. Uh, my boss up in the, the top left-hand corner did eight years with seven special forces group. Uh, there I am with my a and counterpart, the Afghan National Army, Army counterpart, uh, Felicia Pigney, who is a, a SARM first class in the Mass National Guard, and Travis Weiner, uh, who served a couple tours in Iraq with uh, the 101st. Uh, so really our job is to guide veterans into care. If a veteran calls the program, the first person they're talking to is one of us. Uh, so they're talking to another veteran uh, who have probably experienced some of the same things that, uh, that they have, um, and they're not talking to a shrink. Um, if you call up a program, probably the last person you want to talk to is a therapist. Uh, so they get to talk to us first. We go through some of the symptoms they're having, some of their deployment-related experiences, uh, and we get them an appointment within the first two weeks of them calling. So that's kind of the key right there. Um, like I said, mental health is not a priority. So when someone is actually ready to make that call, uh, it's probably at the breaking point. Like, okay, I, I really have to do something about this. I have to call somebody. Um, well, uh, we work very closely with the VA, but they're overloaded. Uh, so if you call for an appointment, it may be a month, maybe two months, and maybe three months before you can get in to see somebody. Uh, everyone who has called our program has gotten their initial appointment within the first two weeks of them calling. So that's important. We provide a three-generation model of the veteran and family care. Uh, so not only do we treat the veteran, but we also treat the family member. And this is anybody that veteran considers family. It's not the DOD sense of the word where it's immediate family, husband, wife, children. Um, this is anybody that veteran considers family, uh, we can provide support for. Uh, and we have an entire separate family team uh, that deals with it. We have child as well as adult psychologists and psychiatrists. We have the couples counselors. Um, Jackie Francona here is on our uh, family team. Uh, and she helps out with all the support groups, things like that. Let's skip this too. Um, so just some of the key messages uh, for healing is mo pe most people return from war uh, and with time and support from their family and friends, they do readjust. Uh, so most people do readjust. I, we, we talk about post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury, um, and PTS is in the spotlight right now. Uh, people believe it's an epidemic, but the reality is, is most people return and are just okay. Uh, they may be dealing with a little bit of stress, um, but in time they get over it. Uh, but there is a cohort, that one-third, uh, that may need some treatment. Uh, and if they do, they need to know that treatment works, um, and it improves the quality of life. Uh, for this generation, I think we look towards my father's generation, who's a Vietnam veteran, we see, um, you know, you see the homelessness, uh, you see the drug dependence that happen a lot with that community, um, and, it's, and it's scary to think about uh, mental health treatment. Uh, but the reality is the treatment works, uh, and the sooner, the better. Um, so don't delay in seeking help. If you know someone who's having an issue, uh, have them call. Uh, if the veteran calls, like I said, they'll talk to one of us, um, but oftentimes the first person to see uh, a change in that veteran is their family member. Uh, so if a family member calls the program, they're going to be connected with someone from our family team, whether it's one of the social workers there, and from there they can get the support, uh, they can come in, um, you know, if they're having, uh, they're, they're wondering how to help that veteran, uh, are they enabling them, uh, if the veteran doesn't want to go to the supermarket, they may say, okay, you don't have to go to the supermarket, um, I'll go for you. And just over time, the world may get smaller and smaller for that veteran. Uh, so just having them be educated uh, is one of the key pieces. So we do uh, a lot of, uh, we have a lot of great uh, events besides, uh, you know, the treatment category. So we do this thing called the Adventure Series. Um, I don't know if you saw me on the news the other day, uh, but no big deal. Uh, we did an event for, uh, with the Boston Duck Boats. Uh, so we had about uh, 200 uh, families uh, come out, 200 total. Um, but a bunch of families come out, they got free rides on duck boats, and then they had Museum of Science tickets afterwards. So it ended and they got to go on the Museum of Science. It's basically just fun events. They're free events to all veterans uh, within New England. Um, and within Massachusetts, there, there are no really active duty bases. Uh, so it's a large component of Mass National Guard. Um, families may be the only military connected family in their town. Uh, so this is a chance to get out and meet other military connected families, other military connected kids, and just have a fun day for the families. Uh, we 
offer what's called the Resilient Warrior course, which we're doing right now with Middlesex Community College and in the summer with Bunker Hill Community College. Uh, and we actually have one going on right now. Uh, it's for women veterans. Um, so right now we have about 25 women veterans uh, in the course. And this is just, uh, this was created with the, the Mass General Hospital's Benson Henry Institute. And the kind of background there is uh, uh, Dr. Benson was a cardiologist. Um, and uh, you know, after cracking chest for 50 years, uh, he wanted to know why people uh, and so many young people were really getting heart attacks. Uh, so what were the cause of a lot of these? And, and a lot of it was just stress-related issues. Uh, so this course is for people who may not need to come in to see somebody once a week or once a month uh, for therapy, but may just need some help with different stressors. So managing sleep uh, it gives you exercise you can do to help get to sleep. Uh, if you get frustrating driving in Massachusetts, which is really rare, um, you, it's, uh, it can help out there as well. Um, and uh, improve communication with family members. So it's basically like a stress uh, program, help alleviate stress. And I actually went through the course, I went through the pilot program. I can tell you that it definitely does help. It helped me out with the sleeping. Um, and uh, just doing different drills uh, to get your body calmed down uh, before you lay down and, uh, and hit, the, hit the rack there. Um, we also offer cl uh, clinical and community education. Um, I did an educational series last week on student veterans, a lot of the same information. Um, but this is something that, uh, that we've done for the third year in a row now, and it provides, uh, they're free, they're archived, um, and it provides CMEs and CEUs for any clinicians. So if there are uh, clinicians within the school here and they need their continuing educational credits, uh, they can watch these videos and receive them. So they get some great education uh, and they also get their continuing edu education credits. All right, we also do research as well. And this is how you access care. Um, you can call the mainline number. Uh, you'll be, uh, the veterans will be connected with one of us. They can contact us through our website with our connect to care email. That basically just says, hey, I'm dealing with something. Can you give me a call? Um, and the families connect the same way as well. So thank you all very much. Uh, I hope it was informative. I hope it wasn't too boring. But. <laughs>